On September 6, 1941, behind the tree-lined moat of Tokyo's old imperial palace in room number one east, a meeting was underway in which Japan would formally adopt a policy that would change the shape and destiny of half the world. On a raised dais before an ancient gold screen, Emperor Hirohito of Japan, Son of Heaven, the 124th in an unbroken line of earthly deities that reached back 2,600 years, sat silent in a crisp military tunic. His narrowed eyes gazed intently through heavy lenses at two brocade-covered tables, behind which the members of the Japanese cabinet and of the Supreme Command, the nation's highest-ranking civilian and military officers, sat stiff as mannequins, hands upon their knees. For two hours, these men rose in turn, bowed to the emperor, and described the desperate situation confronting their nation. The foreign minister began by declaring that the United States, Great Britain and the Netherlands were marshalled against the Japanese Empire. The National Planning Board director warned that the economic blockade these countries had imposed on oil and other raw materials was strangling Japan. The Navy alone was consuming 400 tonnes of oil every hour. The Navy Chief of Staff stated that the nation's fuel reserves would not last through the coming year. His army counterpart grimly assented. After hearing them all, Yoshimichi Hara, the President of the Privy Council and the man who stood between the Cabinet and the throne, spoke tersely. Starting now, said Hara, we will prepare for war. The Emperor then did an extraordinary thing. Raised to reign but not to rule, and trained to acquiesce in Cabinet decisions, Hirohito drew a small slip of paper from his pocket, and in his high nasal voice read a poem that had been written by his grandfather, Emperor Meiji, all the seas everywhere are brothers to each other. Why then do the winds and waves of strife rage so throughout the world? It was the first time since five years earlier, when he had spoken out against an army rebellion, that Hirohito had broken the traditional imperial silence at a council of state. His actions stunned the men assembled. However, it did not change their minds. The decision had already been made, and adopted by the army and navy on September 3rd, to carry through the fateful program. If, by the first week in November, the diplomats of Japan's foreign office could not persuade President Roosevelt to lift his crippling embargo on oil and other raw materials, then Japan would attack the Pacific territories of the United States, Britain and the Netherlands. It would be a desperate gamble, as even the most warlike Japanese leaders knew. The United States, by Tokyo's own estimate, had ten times the production capacity of Japan, Thus, the US was sure to win a long war. The commander of the combined imperial fleet, Admiral Isoroku Yamamoto, voiced the warning bluntly. In the first six to twelve months of a war with the United States and Britain, I will run wild and win victory after victory, Yamamoto declared. After that, I have no expectation of success. Japan's only hope was in a pair of massive and simultaneous surprise assaults, one on the US naval base at Pearl Harbor the other on the mainland and the offshore islands of Southeast Asia. These attacks had to be executed with such stunning speed that the Japanese could consolidate their new empire before the United States war machine rolled into high gear. Then, behind a barrier of Western Pacific bases that would eventually extend in a wide arc from the Kurile Islands in the north, down through Wake Island to the Bismarck Archipelago and New Guinea, Japan might wage a war of attrition that would force the United States to sue for peace and leave Asia in Japanese hands. Many of the wiser leaders in both nations had striven for years to avoid such a collision, but they had struggled against overwhelming odds. The roots of the conflict lay deep in the anguished decade from which Japan had just emerged, a period the Japanese were later to call Kurai Tanima, the Dark Valley. It was a time of economic distress, of plots and abortive coups and assassinations, a time, most significantly, when the Imperial Army gained virtual control of the government and hatched plans of conquest. As the decade began, Japan, calm on the surface, was inwardly smouldering. Poverty and the tensions it breeds were everywhere. More than half the population consisted of hard-scrabbling peasants and fishermen who earned less than one-fifth of the national income. Some 80 million people were crowded into the tiny Japanese home islands, mountainous areas about the size of the state of Montana. Only a sixth of the land was arable. With 2,900 people per square mile of usable farmland, 
Japan was the most crowded nation in the world, and its population was growing at a rate of almost a million a year. One means of relief for the hopelessly overmanned agricultural community was to create an alternate way of life by accelerating Japan's industrialization. But the tariff barriers raised by many nations in the decade following the First World War and the worldwide depression of the 1930s choked the trade on which Japan's industries lived. The obvious alternative then was for the Japanese to find more land to live on. Japan's need for raw materials was as acute as its need for living space and trade, but Asia's riches were in the grip of Western nations. Burma and Malaya, with their deposits of rubber, tin, tungsten and bauxite, belonged to Great Britain. Indochina's rubber plantations were held by France. The East Indies' vast oil reserves were controlled by the Dutch. Many Japanese, knowing their country was the most advanced in the East, began to feel Japan had a right to these riches. Some were convinced Japan had a divine mission to lead Asia into a new era of economic expansion and prosperity, a greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, as Japanese politicians were calling it by 1940. The Japanese, who held the deepest feeling about their nation's crisis and were most determined to act, were young officers of the Imperial Army. Many of these junior officers were sons of poor farmers. They knew the people's misery firsthand. Most of them believed that the nation's problems were attributable to corrupt politicians, and indeed over the past decade the government had been rocked by numerous scandals. The people of Japan tended to agree with the young officers and looked to the army to save the nation. The Imperial Army enjoyed great prestige. It still basked in the glory of Japan's triumph over Russia in the War of 1904 to 1905. It was untainted by scandal. Moreover, it was powerful. An imperial ordinance of 1900 kept it virtually independent of civilian control, a state within a state. Despite the nation's economic plight, the armed forces demanded and got huge budgets. But powerful as they were, the armed forces wanted yet more power. Intense idealism, poverty and a lust for power make a volatile combination. They exploded throughout the decade of the Dark Valley. The first serious rumblings reverberated in March 1931. A plan was hatched for a mob, armed by the military with some 300 bombs, to blow up the buildings that housed the Diet Parliament and the headquarters of the major political parties. The army intended to step in amid the confusion and proclaim a military dictatorship. At the last minute, General Kazushiga Ugaki, who would probably have been installed as a dictatorial prime minister, thought better of the coup and called it off. But it was a warning of things to come. Only six months later, the so-called Kwantung Army, which since 1905 had been guarding Japanese business interests at points scattered through the 440,000 square mile northern Chinese province of Manchuria, simply seized control. The world was shocked, and more significantly, so was official Tokyo. The Kwantung Army officers had seized Manchuria without any orders whatsoever from the government, and proceeded to rule it as an army satrapy. Belatedly ordered to stop, the officers ignored the directive, whereupon, after a considerable amount of sputtering, the government recognized the army's fait accompli, dubbed the acquired territory Manchukuo, and encouraged people to emigrate there. The Kwantung army's surprising and successful adventure on the Asian continent did not quiet the unrest at home. On the contrary, it led to a series of assassinations, as young officers and other super-patriots set out to kill the politicians who had resisted the Manchurian adventure. On February 9, 1932, former finance minister Junosuke Inouye was gunned down on a Tokyo sidewalk. On May 15, nine army and navy officers, having prayed to the sun goddess, burst into the home of the 75-year-old incumbent Prime Minister Tsuyoshi Inukai, an opponent of the Manchurian takeover. Inukai, appearing wholly unafraid, politely led them to an inner room where, Japanese style, they removed their shoes. One impatient conspirator, however, became excited and yelled out, No use talking! Fire! All nine emptied their guns into the courageous old man. During the sensational trials that followed these killings, public sympathy flowed not toward the victims, but toward their murderers. The killers had struck a heroic blow for the people against the corrupt politicians. Who else but the military could end the depression? One of Inukai's assassins said the Prime Minister had been 
sacrificed on the altar of national reformation. So strong was the outpouring of public sympathy that a group of nine men offered to take the assassin's place in the dock, and to prove their sincerity, I accompanied the offer with their nine little fingers, severed and preserved in alcohol. The killers received relatively light sentences. None was condemned to death. These killings were only a prelude to the bloody army uprising of February 26, 1936, which, because of the date, was called the 2 26 Incident. A cabal of young army officers marched some 1,500 troops out of their barracks at four o'clock on that cold, snowy morning and laid siege to the governmental centre of Tokyo. Officers roamed the city, trying to assassinate Admiral Keisuke Okada, who was the new Prime Minister and much of the cabinet. The Prime Minister escaped by hiding under dirty laundry in a closet when the killers came to his house. Not so fortunate was Finance Minister Korokio Takahashi, loathed because he had resisted the previous year's large military budget. After rampaging through his house, breaking down doors, the killer officers found Takahashi in his bedroom. A lieutenant kicked the quilt off the minister and yelled, Tenchu, meaning punishment of heaven. Takahashi yelled back, Idiot, before he was shot and killed. Another officer slashed at Takahashi, severing an arm, then stabbed him in the stomach. At this point, Takahashi's distraught wife appeared. The young lieutenant bowed and said, Excuse me for the annoyance I have caused. Another victim was a former prime minister, Viscount Makoto Saito, a moderate intellectual gentleman. Saito and his wife had spent the evening before as dinner guests of the United States ambassador to Japan, Joseph C. Grew. After dinner, there had been a screening of the sentimental American musical Naughty Marietta with Jeanette MacDonald and Nelson Eddy. It was an appropriate film to show the Saitos, Grew felt, because it had, in his words, no vulgarity whatever. The Saitos left the embassy at 11.30, a late hour for them. By dawn the next morning, Saito was dead, his body pierced by 36 bullets. After four days of killings, the terror ended as abruptly as it had begun, the insurgent troops returning to barracks on the Emperor's orders. But this time the ringleaders did not get off lightly. Hirohito and many of the senior military officers were becoming alarmed at the killing of high government men, and within the army the killer's rivals saw a chance to do away with their competitors. A number were speedily court-martialed and executed, but the dreadful two, 26 incident did not discredit the military in the eyes of the people or reduce the army's political power. Quite the opposite. From February 1936 to the outbreak of war in 1941, Japanese politicians who blocked any of the army's plans lived in fear of assassination. Further, the army and navy chiefs had long enjoyed the prerogative of choosing each cabinet's war and naval ministers. Thus, when the military service's top officers disliked what a cabinet was doing, they could recall the war and naval ministers and force the cabinet to fall. In short, the military could virtually dictate any cabinet's policy. American Ambassador Joseph Grew watched all this with growing apprehension. Grew was a tall and dignified man, with grey hair and startlingly black and luxuriant eyebrows. Like the proper Bostonian he was, he had gone to Groton Preparatory School and Harvard College. At both institutions he had known Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was two classes behind Grew. The ambassador was a passionate golfer. When actor Douglas Fairbanks visited Japan, he and Grew played 36 holes in one day in the rain. Grew delighted the Japanese, who were enthusiastic about both golf and baseball, by playing a round of golf with visiting baseball heroes Babe Ruth and Lefty O'Doul. Grew was also a serious, experienced and adept diplomat. He understood Japan remarkably well, thanks in large measure to his wife, who had grown up in Japan and knew the language perfectly. Whatever way it falls out, Grew wrote in his diary, one thing is certain, and that is that the military are distinctly running the government and that no step can be taken without their approval. Grew had been named ambassador in 1932. By 1934, he was warning Washington that Japan had designs on all of East Asia. When Japanese speak of Japan's being the stabilizing factor and the guardian of peace of East Asia, what they have in mind is a Pax Japonica, he advised. The next step, he said, would be complete political control. There is a swashbuckling temper in the country, Grew concluded.
that might lead the government to any extremes and eventually to national self-termination. Not even the perceptive Gru, however, foresaw what was to happen next. On July 7, 1937, a detachment of patrolling Japanese troops met a Chinese unit near Peking, at an ancient bridge named after Marco Polo. A skirmish ensued and a few soldiers fell. This was sufficient excuse for Major General Kenji Doihara to lead the Kwantung Army, which already had slid into parts of northern China to protect Japanese businesses there, to launch a major attack. Before long, what the Japanese called the China Incident developed into a full-scale war. More troops and ships were rushed to reinforce Doihara's forces. With them came Japanese army and navy planes, modern bombers to smash defenseless Chinese cities. One after another, the cities Peking, Tientsin, Shanghai fell to the Japanese. The poorly equipped Chinese, under 51-year-old Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, fell back after each major engagement, losing hundreds of thousands of lives. Chiang's withdrawal kept his battered army reasonably intact, but it also left a large part of the nation naked in the face of an increasingly ruthless foe. In the Kiangsu province of eastern China, the Japanese marched into the virtually defenceless city of Nanking and reduced it in sadistic fashion. Some 20,000 Chinese men of military age were marched out of the city and used for bayonet practice, machine-gunned or doused with gasoline and set on fire. Perhaps 20,000 women and girls were raped, killed or mutilated. Thousands of other civilians were murdered and robbed. As many as 40,000 Chinese were slaughtered before what came to be called the Rape of Nanking was over. It seems clear the Japanese officers, who talked of bringing a Japanese-inspired renaissance to Asia, had intended the massacre to terrify the Chinese into making peace. The plan failed. Chiang spurned negotiation with Tokyo. In October 1938, he retreated farther into China's vast interior, moving the capital from Hankou to Chongqing. Assisted by a communist guerrilla leader named Mao Zedong, with whom he had a temporary alliance of convenience, Chiang shored up his defences and refused to quit. The Japanese tried to pursue him and lay siege, but the enormous expanse of China, served by only a threading of dirt roads, seemed to swallow up the million or more advancing Japanese troops. China became a quagmire for the imperial army, and the more deeply Japan became involved in China, the more sharply the Tokyo government found itself in collision with the West, especially with the United States, which at the time nurtured a sentimental fondness for China. In October 1937, President Roosevelt gave a speech condemning Japan's aggression. A leading Japanese, Yosuke Matsuoka, soon to be foreign minister, lashed back, Japan is expanding, and what country in its expansion era has ever failed to be trying to its neighbours? Ask the American Indian or the Mexican how excruciatingly trying the young United States used to be. American concern was increasing, but the president's ability to respond was restricted. Americans were overwhelmingly isolationist. Even when Japanese planes intentionally bombed the American gunboat, the Panay, in the Yangtze River on December 12, 1937, there was no inclination to fight. When news of the incident reached Washington, Senator Henrik Shipstead of Minnesota blamed the Americans. What are they doing there anyway? he asked. Why don't they all get out? Nevertheless, the United States seemed to be awakening to the danger. In January 1938, a month after the Panay went down, President Roosevelt asked for and got a 20% increase in naval appropriations for the beginnings of a two-ocean navy. At the same time, Roosevelt began to tighten the economic screws on Japan. He called on US manufacturers of munitions and aircraft not to sell those items to Japan, so long as they were used for the slaughter of Chinese. The arms boycott was strictly voluntary a moral embargo, but it worked. A year and a half later, in October 1939, the president quietly took his first military step toward Japan. He ordered the US Pacific Fleet from its traditional home base of San Diego to the mid-Pacific. Henceforth, it would operate from Pearl Harbor on the Hawaiian island of Oahu. Roosevelt knew the Navy was not ready for major offensive operations, and the defenses at Pearl Harbor were weak. Still, he felt the westward move of a mass of capital ships would be a clear message to Japan. The Japanese were far from deterred. Indeed, their impulse toward further expansion was encouraged by Hitler's 1940 Blitzkrieg in Europe. 
As the German armies rolled over the Netherlands and France, and then gathered themselves for an invasion of Britain, the Dutch, French and British colonies in Asia suddenly seemed ripe for plucking. On August 1st, 1940, Ambassador Grew warned that Japanese militarists now saw a golden opportunity to pursue their expansionist desires unhampered by the allegedly hamstrung democracies. And Grew added, The German military machine and system and their brilliant successes have gone to the Japanese head like strong wine. A new cabinet had just taken over in Japan. It was headed by Prince Fumimaro Konoye, a hesitant, quiet man who was overshadowed by two other cabinet members, the strong-willed Minister of War, Lutuot General Hideki Tojo, and the Foreign Minister, Yosuke Matsuoka. Arrogant, ambitious and dazzlingly brilliant, some thought him mad Matsuoka had been raised and educated in Portland, Oregon. And he fancied himself an expert on America. It is my America and my American people that really exist, Matsuoka once declared grandly. There is no other. His colleagues conceded him that expertise and gave him a freer hand in conducting Japanese foreign policy than any previous foreign minister had had. Matsuoka's main problem was that he could not keep his mouth shut. One moment he would send US Secretary of State Cordell Hull a message overflowing with expressions of goodwill. The next, he would tell an American newspaper correspondent that democracy was finished, that the fascist states would inevitably win the war, and there was no room in the world for two systems of government. Hull quite naturally decided the Japanese government in general, and Matsuoka in particular, could not be trusted. Hull's suspicion of Japan's motives would become a factor in bringing on war. This mounting distrust was deepened, ironically enough, by an important United States triumph. American cryptographers had cracked Japan's highest diplomatic code. From August 1941, they could intercept the secret cable traffic between Tokyo and Japan's overseas embassies. The intercepts were given the code name MAGIC, so whenever Hull listened to the latest diplomatic peace offers from Japan's ambassador to Washington, a hearty, sincere, guileless exadmiral named Kichisaburo Nomura, he would have already read MAGIC intercepts indicating that Japan was not really bent on peace, but rather was preparing for war. Hull was a stiff-backed mountain man from Tennessee with an ingrained loathing for duplicity and double-dealing. His straight-on Protestant mind believed that diplomacy could and should be carried on in a forthright, honest, open fashion. Slow to anger, he was capable of deep hatred when aroused, and he was coming to hate the Japanese. On September 27, 1940, Foreign Minister Matsuoka made a major move that did nothing to reassure Hull. He signed a pact firmly aligning Japan with Germany and Italy. Almost immediately, Japan put pressure on the Dutch to sell more of their East Indian oil. At about the same time, the Japanese pressured the French shadow government in Vichy to allow Japanese troops to be stationed in French Indochina, later to be called Vietnam. Japan's announced reason was that it needed troops in Indochina to cover the southern flank of the China campaign. But to Hull and to Roosevelt and Churchill, it plainly looked as if Japan was getting itself in position to invade Burma or Malaya, possibly to attack the great British base at Singapore. The French gave in, and Japanese soldiers and aircraft poured into Indochina. Roosevelt and Hull had known for some time that the move was coming. Magic intercepts, including one containing the entire ultimatum to Vichy, had tipped them off. In July 1941, while Japanese troops were going ashore at Kamran Bay and occupying Saigon and Da Nang in Indochina, Roosevelt announced a complete embargo of all oil shipments to Japan. He had already reduced petroleum and cotton consignments to the Japanese and had embargoed shipment of other vital materials, such as scrap iron, as one way of trying to warn Japan to abandon the war in China. Now all Japanese assets in America were frozen and all United States trade with Japan was cut off. Britain and the Netherlands followed suit. The Japanese were deeply disturbed by these measures. A flurry of conferences followed, involving top Japanese military and political leaders. Emissaries were sent to Washington to help the plodding Nomura, but the Japanese position and that of the United States remained desperately far apart. Hull and Roosevelt indicated that the oil tap would not be turned on again unless Japan got out of Indochina, and China as well, and also renounced the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. The Japanese replied that the notion of getting out of China was unthinkable, 
They had invested too many men and too many millions of yen in the China incident to pull out now. On the contrary, they wanted the United States to get out of China, that is, to stop sending arms to Chiang. Despite the tremendous gap between the two nations' basic positions, the diplomats struggled, especially the seemingly tireless Gru. He wrote long letters to his old schoolmate pleading for greater understanding of Japanese psychology. The Japanese should not be made to conclude that they were cornered, Gru wrote the president, for they would pressure the French shadow government in Vichy to allow Japanese troops to be stationed in French Indochina later to be called Vietnam. Japan's announced reason was that it needed troops in Indochina to cover the southern flank of the China campaign, but to Hull and to Roosevelt and Churchill, it plainly looked as if Japan was getting itself in position to invade Burma or Malaya, possibly to attack the great British base at Singapore. The French gave in, and Japanese soldiers and aircraft poured into Indochina. Roosevelt and Hull had known for some time that the move was coming. Magic intercepts, including one containing the entire ultimatum to Vichy, had tipped them off. In July 1941, while Japanese troops were going ashore at Kamran Bay and occupying Saigon and Da Nang in Indochina, Roosevelt announced a complete embargo of all oil shipments to Japan. He had already reduced petroleum and cotton consignments to the Japanese and had embargoed shipment of other vital materials, such as scrap iron, as one way of trying to warn Japan to abandon the war in China. Now all Japanese assets in America were frozen, and all United States trade with Japan was cut off. Britain and the Netherlands followed suit. The Japanese were deeply disturbed by these measures. A flurry of conferences followed, involving top Japanese military and political leaders. Emissaries were sent to Washington to help the plodding Nomura, but the Japanese position and that of the United States remained desperately far apart. Hull and Roosevelt indicated that the oil tap would not be turned on again unless Japan got out of Indochina, and China as well, and also renounced the tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. The Japanese replied that the notion of getting out of China was unthinkable. They had invested too many men and too many millions of yen in the China incident to pull out now. On the contrary, they wanted the United States to get out of China, that is, to stop sending arms to Chiang. Despite the tremendous gap between the two nations' basic positions, the diplomats struggled, especially the seemingly tireless Gru. He wrote long letters to his old schoolmate pleading for greater understanding of Japanese psychology. The Japanese should not be made to conclude that they were cornered, Gru wrote the president, for they would feel impelled to lash out. By now the impetuous Matsuoka had been replaced as foreign minister by the level-headed Admiral Tejiro Toyoda. On the hottest evening of August 1941, Gru talked for hours with Toyoda the longest conversation, Gru said that I have ever had with any foreign minister. As Gru wrote down Toyoda's remarks, it was drip, 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 so after the first hour Admiral Toyoda ordered cold drinks and cold wet towels to swab off with. He made a gesture to take off his coat and looked at me smilingly and questioningly. Of course I nodded, so we both took off our coats, rolled up our sleeves, and again pitched into the work. In September, Gru wrote his boss, Secretary of State Hull, a long, painstaking and closely reasoned cable pleading for what he called constructive conciliation rather than economic strangulation. The Japanese would never agree to abandon their invasion of China, he said. Therefore, if the United States wanted to negotiate a peace agreement, that demand would have to be soft-pedaled. He heartily endorsed a suggestion made by Toyoda that President Roosevelt meet with the Japanese Prime Minister, Prince Fumimaro Konoye, perhaps in Hawaii. He warned Secretary Hull that the Japanese were entirely capable of entertaining two contradictory ideas at once that they could prepare for war and at the same time sincerely search for peace. Hull would not be persuaded. Although Roosevelt was more than willing to meet Prime Minister Konoya, the Secretary of State torpedoed the idea. Hull had in his desk a fateful magic intercept that revealed Japan's plans to take over both Indochina and Thailand. Thus, he simply did not believe that the Japanese had any intention of giving up their plans for the conquest of Asia. Both Hull and FDR were under great pressure to be unbending toward Japan. Washington was full of noisy pro-Chinese partisans who kept public opinion whipped to a froth. 
The leader of the China lobby was T.V. Sung, a brother-in-law of Chiang Kai-shek. Chiang himself bombarded Hull and Roosevelt with what Hull called hysterical cables, urging that the United States send him more supplies and money, and arguing against any compromise with the Japanese. There was some pressure, too, from FDR's cabinet. The secretaries of Navy and War, Frank Knox and Henry L. Stimson, counseled taking a strong line, since they were convinced that Japan either was bluffing and would prove unwilling to fight, or was too weak militarily to do much damage if it did go to war. This position was echoed inside Hull's State Department by the head of the Asia desk, Stanley Hornbeck. He too believed Japan was bluffing, and he thought that the United States could easily defeat any Japanese military moves within six months. There was pressure to be firm from Churchill as well. He even drafted strong notes that he urged Roosevelt to sign and send to Tokyo. Roosevelt did not send the notes, nor did he allow his friend Churchill to dictate United States policy. FDR, to the last, wanted to reach some accommodation with Japan. The possibility that the United States might become directly involved in the struggle against Hitler was never far from his mind, and he knew that one war ATA time was more than enough. Indeed, General George Marshall, Chief of Staff of the Army, and Admiral Harold R. Stark, Chief of Naval Operations, had told him the US armed forces were far from ready to fight any war. The various pressures on Roosevelt and his Secretary of State increased through the autumn of 1941. Grew kept warning from Tokyo that war could come with dangerous and dramatic suddenness. Two last attempts were made to avoid a conflict. The Japanese envoys in Washington presented a short-term plan, a kind of modus vivendi, that did not solve all the fundamental issues but at least offered some bargaining points. In exchange for resumption of oil shipments from the United States, Japan would cease military moves in Southeast Asia, and once peace with China was restored or an overall peace in the Pacific established, would withdraw troops from all foreign soil. Hull called the plan preposterous. Roosevelt, fearing an end to negotiations, had penciled in his own modus vivendi, a resumption of economic relations with Japan in return for an end to Japanese troop movements north and south, and a renewal of peace negotiations with China. This plan, too, might have provided a basis for further diplomatic talks, but the Japanese never saw it. As Hull was pondering FDR's proposal, on the night of November 25th, word came from US Army intelligence that a huge Japanese convoy of warships and troop transports was steaming through the China Sea toward Southeast Asia and perhaps the Dutch East Indies. What was the use of presenting a conciliatory proposal to a nation so evidently bent on war? Roosevelt's plan was laid aside. Instead, Hull sent off to Tokyo a document later to be known as his Ten Points. Ten stern conditions reaffirming the fundamental demand that Japan turn the clock back to 1931 by getting out of Indochina, China and Manchuria, and by renouncing their tripartite pact with Germany and Italy. Why Roosevelt let Hull substitute this outright challenge for his own moderate approach is not clear. The Secretary's sense of moral outrage seems at this point to have overborne his boss's reservations. Most experts today agree that Hull's diplomacy lacked imagination and flexibility, the very qualities that grew, who had no illusions about Japan's willingness or ability to wage war, had been urging on his superiors. As Grew could have predicted, the Ten Points struck the Japanese leaders in much the same way as the news of Japanese troop movements had affected Hull. This new evidence of United States intransigence convinced them there was no hope in further negotiation. They must strike now or sit quietly and be strangled. Throughout that fateful fall, Japan had been perfecting its war plans. The 25th Army, under Lutsa General Tomoyuki Yamashita, was to slice southward down the slender, 600-mile-long Malay Peninsula and take the fortress of Singapore with its key naval base. The 14th Army, under Luti, General Masaharu Homa, was to invade the American-owned Philippines, a potential thorn in the eastern flank of Japan's push south. The Japanese Navy and the 16th Army, under Lieutenant General Hitoshi Imamura, would seize the biggest prize of all, the oil-rich Dutch East Indies. The 15th Army, under Lieutenant General Shojiro Lida, was to step off from Thailand into Burma and close the Burma Road the last Allied overland supply route from India to China.
The man responsible for the Japanese Navy's war plan was solid and respected, but his attack plan provoked a storm of controversy. No one in Japan was more opposed to war with the United States than Admiral of the Combined Fleet, Il Soroku Yamamoto. Yamamoto knew American strength firsthand. He had studied briefly at Harvard and had spent two years in Washington as a naval attaché. Japan cannot beat America, he told a group of Japanese schoolchildren in 1940. Therefore, Japan should not fight America. Yamamoto had played no part in the decision for war. Indeed, he had been sent to sea to get him out of range of would-be assassins who thought his anti-war views unpatriotic. But now that the decision for war was made, Yamamoto was adamant on one point. It was imperative that Japan destroy the US fleet at Pearl Harbor. Every member of the Navy general staff opposed the scheme, and the arguments against it were compelling. Surprise was essential for its success, but how could an armada of six aircraft carriers and perhaps two dozen support ships load up, leave Japanese waters and steam halfway across the Pacific undetected? The only route that would avoid commercial shipping was across the chill North Pacific. But how could they refuel underway in these storm-tossed winter seas? If the plan had to be aborted, the fleet would have been uselessly diverted from the main operation and might have to fight the United States fleet in wholly unfamiliar waters. Most important, the inherent risks outweighed the potential gains. There was no need, the dissidents argued, to attack the US fleet. Yamamoto insisted. Security could and would be maintained. The technical problems could be solved. And as for the need for the attack, he asserted, the US fleet is a dagger pointed at our throat. Should war be declared, the length and breadth of our southern operations would be exposed to serious threat on its flank. But only when Yamamoto threatened to resign his commission and retire if the plan was not approved, did the general staff concede. If he has that much confidence, declared the Navy Chief of Staff, it is better to let Yamamoto go ahead. He was already well along in preparations. At Kagoshima, a small southern city topographically similar to Honolulu, hand-picked squadrons of Japanese Navy pilots had been practicing pinpoint bombing and torpedo attacks since late summer. So incessant was the din of aircraft engines that the hens in one seaside village quit laying eggs. At night, the flyers pored over a model of Oahu seven feet square and studied silhouettes of the US ships at Pearl Harbor until they could call out their names at a glance. Meanwhile, the Japanese consul general in Honolulu had been cabling back weekly coded reports on US fleet movements, harbor berthing positions and duty schedules. The fleet, Yamamoto noted, was in port every Saturday and Sunday. The Army's proposal for a strike on Sunday, December 8th, Tokyo time would be fine. By late November, Yamamoto had imposed radio silence on Kido Butai, the Pearl Harbor strike fleet, and ordered other Japanese warships on the inland sea to send out a flurry of bogus messages. He charted a course that would take the force down a lonely slot between Dutch Harbor in the Aleutians and Midway Island, just beyond range of US air patrols. For staging, he chose a remote harbour in Japan's frozen Kurile Islands called Hitokapu Bay. At 6am on November 26th, the strike fleet weighed anchor and under strict radio silence slid out into the chill North Pacific waters. A patrol boat at the harbour mouth flashed a message. Good luck on your mission. The dark grey flagship carrier Akagi signalled, thanks. At the flight deck control post beneath Akagi's bridge, Captain Mitsuo Fuchida, the commander of the Pearl Harbor Airstrike Force, looked back as the Kurile's rugged mountains, like a Hiroshiga landscape painting, receded into the mists. Down on deck, Akagi's crew also took a last look at their homeland. Fuchida was profoundly moved. I realized my duty as a warrior, he wrote later. I thought at the time, who could be luckier than I? Twelve days later, just before dawn on December 7th, Hawaiian time, the Japanese strike force reached the launch point, 230 miles due north of Oahu, just as other Japanese forces around the rim of Asia were nearing their destinations. In the central Pacific, the sky was still dark, the horizon not yet visible. The big ships heaved ponderously in heavy seas, kicking foamy white spume off black waters and hurling plumes of stinging sea spray over carrier decks. Ground crews clung desperately to the fighters and bombers now lined up wing to wing, 
Well before dawn, the engines started turning over, hurling prop wash back with the wind. Wing lights trembled as the planes strained at their moorings. Yamamoto's final message had clicked in over the wireless, echoing the rallying cry of the commander of the victorious Japanese fleet at the Battle of Tsushima against Russia 36 years before. The rise or fall of our empire now hinges on this battle. From the flight deck, the green light flashed for takeoff. From the cockpit of the lead fighter, Captain Fuchida yelled to his crew chief, Kick out the blocks! The plane lurched forward, gathered speed and lifted itself into the still dark sky. In a matter of moments, the sun would rise. Mitsuo Fuchida flung back his cockpit canopy and surveyed the awesome air fleet he commanded. He could not see all the planes, but enough were in sight to reassure him everything was ready. Directly aft, strung out through billowing towers of white clouds, were the leaders of the 48 blunt-nosed, single-engine Nakajima 97 bombers like his own, each carrying a one 760-pound armor-piercing bomb. To his right and slightly below, Fuchida could see some 40 more torpedo bombers, whose projectiles were designed for shallow harbor water. To the left and a little above were 51 stubby Aichi dive bombers, and high overhead, their dual machine guns and twin 20mm cannons at the ready, droned 43 Mitsubishi Type-O fighters, the fast, deadly Zeros, soon to dominate Asia's skies. On each plane's fuselage and wingtips blazed the neat red disc of the rising sun, as much a religious symbol as a national insignia. Ahead, beneath a thick cloud blanket, lay Fuchida's target, Pearl Harbor. This was to be the most daring strike in the massive surprise attack Japan had already launched across the breadth of the Western Pacific. Even as Fuchida's planes neared Hawaii, a Japanese task force was shelling the dark forested coast of Malaya. Other troops were assaulting British pillbox positions on Kotabaru's shores and swarming over Thailand's beaches at Singora and Patani, clearing the way for a coordinated drive down the 600-mile-long Malay Peninsula to the British bastion of Singapore. Meanwhile, Japan's air arm would soon begin bombing the Philippines, Guam, Wake Island, and the British Crown Colony of Hong Kong. The key move in this far-flung and deadly chess game was the destruction of the US Pacific Fleet, lying at anchor at Pearl Harbor, and this move depended on the skill of the 39-year-old commander of the Air Armada winging south above the bright Pacific. The time was 7 a.m. Fuchida switched on his radio. Hawaiian music filtered faintly through his headphones. He twisted his antenna until the music was loudest. Then, bearing on it, he made a five-degree course correction. Fuchida twisted the dial again. Over the wind and engine roar, he heard what he was hoping for. Partly cloudy, the Honolulu announcer stated. Clouds mostly over the mountains. Visibility good. Wind north at ten knots. Fuchida rejoiced. What a windfall for us, he exclaimed. The planes came in over Kahuku Point, Oahu's northern tip, banked to the right and flew down the island's west coast. The torpedo bombers wanted to make their final run from the south, low over the water. As the planes approached the target area, Pearl Harbor was clearly visible to Fuchida. Peering through binoculars, he scanned the blue water closely, and a stunning spectacle came into view. He carefully counted the ships below, lying quietly at anchor. They are all there, all right he thought exultantly. Seven towering grey vessels were lined up on Battleship Row, on the eastern edge of Ford Island, in the centre of the harbour. That would be the California, at the southwestern end of the row. Then, moored together in pairs, the Maryland and the Oklahoma, the Tennessee and the West Virginia, the Arizona and the repair ship Vestal, and finally, alone at the northeastern end of the row, the Nevada. An eighth battle wagon, the flagship Pennsylvania, lay in dry dock with the destroyers Cassin and Downs, at the Navy Yard across the channel from Battleship Row. Nine cruisers, another twenty-nine destroyers, and an array of lesser ships were ranged around the harbour at bollards or moorings. In all, ninety-four vessels were densely clustered in an area not three miles square, with but one channel to the open sea and a single torpedo net stretched across the channel's mouth. Never, even in the deepest peace, Fuchida later recalled, had he seen a target so thoroughly unprotected. He glanced at his watch. It was 7.49. He ordered his radio man. Notify all planes to launch attacks. The signal went out plain. Two, 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 
first syllable of the word, Totsugeki, charge. Then, looking down at the US fleet lying at his mercy, he flashed to his fleet and to Tokyo a fateful message, Tora, 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 Tiger, 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 signifying that the attack was a complete surprise. Beneath Fuchida's attacking force, Pearl Harbor stirred lazily in the Sunday morning sun. At 7.50 a.m., much of the civilian population was still asleep. Sunrise had been at 6.26, but the rain-filled clouds over Mount Tantalus and Mount Olympus on the south side of the island had obscured the sun until nearly 7 o'clock. The light northern breeze made the palm fronds rattle. There were few other sounds. A distant automobile horn along the twisting Nuanu Valley Road, the squawk of a pet parrot, the echo of surf on Diamond Head. In the warming sunlight, rich with the smell of frangipani, patios were still empty, their umbrellas folded. Oahu lay in helpless torpor. It was not as if there had been no warnings. As America's negotiations with Japan had neared impasse, Washington had sent numerous advisories to its Pacific outposts. The Philippines, Guam, Wake, Hawaii, even the Panama Canal Zone. The U.S. Army Signal Corps had broken the Purple Code, Japan's cipher for top-priority diplomatic communications, and had been decoding secret Japanese messages for over a year. These messages clearly indicated that Japan was preparing for war. There were other sources of information about Japanese plans as well. Japanese secret agents on the island of Oahu had been advising Tokyo by phone of U.S. military dispositions. A United States law forbade the tapping of telephones, including those of alien Japanese, but the Office of Naval Intelligence and the FBI often ignored the law and listened in on these calls. One of them, overheard shortly before December 7th, had revealed that the Japanese were burning the files at their Honolulu consulate. The Navy reported that the Japanese had changed their communications call signals twice within the past month. Normally, such changes were made every six months or so. Such an abrupt switch was unprecedented. What should have been more ominous news was the Navy's report that it had picked up no radio signals at all from the aircraft carriers of Japan's first and second fleets, and therefore had not known their locations since November 16th. When Admiral Husband E. Kimmel, Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, was told by his intelligence officer on December 2nd that the carriers were still unaccounted for, he appeared unconcerned. Do you mean to say, he joked, they could be rounding Diamond Head and you wouldn't know it? Admiral Kimmel had reason for his relaxed attitude. Everyone knew Japan was going onto a war footing. Everyone expected to hear of a Japanese attack on nearly any country in the Far East, but certainly not on Hawaii, halfway across the Pacific. On November 27th, Admiral H.R. Stark, Chief of Naval Operations, had sent an urgent message from Washington to the Pacific Admirals. It read, This dispatch is to be considered a war warning. An aggressive move by Japan is expected within the next few days. But, he added, the evidence indicates an amphibious expedition against either the Philippines, Thai, or Kra Peninsula, or possibly Borneo. There was no mention of Hawaii. Despite all the indications of trouble brewing, no one was upset. Everything could be explained. Intelligence officers reasoned the Japanese carriers were out of radio contact because they were in home waters. Japanese call signals could have been changed because of preparations for a massive fleet movement south from Japan, where most evidence indicated the Japanese were about to move. The phone calls from Oahu to Japan were not disturbing. Japanese on the islands had been telephoning home to friends and relatives for years. And the report of paper burning? The Americans, too, burned secret papers periodically. Besides, warnings of every sort, reports of Japanese destroying their codes, false submarine sightings, tales of spying throughout the islands, had poured into Pearl Harbor's intelligence offices for months. They were nothing new. What the intelligence officers did not know was that these warnings were different. On a tapped telephone line, the FBI had heard a cook in the Japanese consulate excitedly tell a friend in Honolulu that consular officials were burning all important documents. This was a crucial piece of information. The Japanese were not just burning surplus documents, they were destroying everything. Moreover, the FBI knew the burnings were being conducted secretly in the consulate, not outdoors where they might be observed. The FBI agents had reported none of this critical detail. To have done so would have disclosed their illegal telephone taps. They reported only what they felt was important,
and the Navy intelligence officers did not press them for more. They merely assumed these latest reports were more of the same the significance of the information was lost. Adding to the general sense of false security in Hawaii was an illusion of American invincibility. The Japanese, the Americans told themselves, would not dare attack Pearl Harbor or risk the wrath of the mighty U.S. Navy. If anybody had experienced a doubt, he would have kept it to himself, or at least within his own service. There was an almost complete lack of cooperation among the American military forces in Hawaii. Members of the various branches were friendly, but made little effort to work together or share information. The climate and comfort of Hawaii also helped lull American forces. No one hurried to get things done or to work a full day in the languorous tropical setting. On Sunday morning, December 7th, there were two last-minute warnings that might have saved the day, but both were discounted by the people who might have acted. At 3.42 on the morning of December 7th, the watch officer of the US minesweeper Condor cited something suspicious as the Condor was making a pass across the entrance to Pearl Harbor. It looked like the periscope of a submerged submarine. By blinker light, the Condor signaled the destroyer ward patrolling nearby. The ward's skipper, Lieutenant William Outerbridge, was awakened by his gunnery officer. In his Japanese kimono, Outerbridge came on deck and stared out across the dark sea. It was the first patrol of his first command, and he took no chances. He ordered a call to general quarters. All hands on deck searched the waters, while the ward crisscrossed a wide pattern for half an hour. No periscope could be seen. Nothing registered on the sound detection gear. Outerbridge sent the crew back to their bunks, while those on regular watch maintained the lookout. No message was sent to headquarters. There had been so many false sightings, Outerbridge did not want to look foolish by reporting another. Three hours later, at 6.40, the ward's helmsman spotted another periscope. Lieutenant Outerbridge came on deck again. This time there was no mistake. A small conning tower was clearly visible only 100 yards from the ward. It was headed toward the harbour. Outerbridge ordered an attack. The ward opened fire. No. One gun missed, but no. Three guns scored a bullseye on the conning tower. The sub began to sink as the ward's crew cheered. Outerbridge ordered four depth charges and radioed headquarters. We have attacked, fired upon and dropped depth charges upon submarine operating in defensive sea area. It was 6.53 a.m. The headquarters message centre, at this hour on Sunday morning, was manned by Lieutenant Commander Harold Kaminsky and a telephone operator. Kaminsky, a reserve officer who had been in and out of the Navy since World War I, was the one US military man that morning who actually concluded from the evidence that the war was on. His orders were, in case of attack, to call Admiral Kimmel's Chief of Staff and the aide to Rear Admiral C.C. Block, Commandant of the 14th Naval District. After receiving Outerbridge's message, Kaminsky tried to call Block's aide, but could not reach him. Then he called the fleet duty officer and Kimmel's chief of staff, Captain John B. Earl. Earl told Kaminsky to confirm the ward's message and to alert the various military departments at Honolulu. Kaminsky requested confirmation from the ward and then started calling the Coast Guard, the war plans officer and all department heads. The confirmation never came. He was still making calls when the attack began at 7.55. Meanwhile, Captain Earl called Admiral Block to tell him of the ward's message. The two men concluded that the sub-sighting probably was false, and that if it was not, the ward and a relief destroyer nearby could handle the situation. They decided to await further developments. The midget submarine that was sunk had come from the Japanese Advance Expeditionary Force of 27 submarines, five carrying midget subs, all intended to distract US attention from the air attack and cause what damage they could. The force achieved nothing, and through the engagement with the ward, almost gave away the Japanese attack. The second warning signal was even clearer. The island of Oahu had an Army aircraft warning service consisting of five mobile radar units and an information centre at Fort Shafter, just east of Pearl Harbour. The radar sets had been installed only in recent weeks, and few operators had mastered them. Nor were the units manned all the time. During December, the hours were supposed to be 4 a.m. to 7 a.m. Previously, the units had been manned from 6 a.m. to 11.30 a.m., plus a few hours in the afternoon, 
But in November, General Walter Short had changed the times after a war warning from Washington. He considered early morning the most likely hours for an attack. Some of the units operated until 11 a.m. mostly for training, except on Sundays when they quit at 7. One of these portable radar units was set up at Opana on the northern tip of Oahu. On the morning of December 7th, it was manned by two privates, George Elliott, who was new to radar, and Joseph Lockhart, who was teaching Elliott how to operate the set and work the plotting board. There was little to plot. They picked up a suspicious blip at 6.45 and reported it to Fort Shafter, where the operator thanked them and noted it down. Actually, it was a Japanese cruiser floatplane reconnoitering ahead of Fuchida's attack force. At 7am, the radar set was due to be shut down, but Elliot wanted to keep it on and practice longer. At 7.02, he was surprised to see a large blip on the oscilloscope. Lockhart, leaning over Elliot's shoulder explaining how the set operated, took over the controls. There on the screen was the largest blip he had ever seen. He checked the set to make sure it was not malfunctioning. It was not. The blip looked like two waves of planes. Working at the plotting board, Elliot placed the planes at 137 miles north, 3 degree east. Though new to radar, Elliot understood the blip's significance. He suggested calling the information centre. Lockard said that wasn't necessary. Elliot persisted. Lockard said, well, go ahead if you like. Elliot tried to reach the information centre on his headphone. The line was dead. He switched to the administration line, an army telephone, and got through. There's a huge number of planes, he reported, coming in from the north, three degree east. Private Joseph MacDonald, at the information centre switchboard, replied that he would record the sighting. But nobody else was there, and MacDonald said that he didn't know what he could do about it. Well, get someone who does know and let him take care of it, said Elliot. He hung up. MacDonald recorded the report turned to note the time, and saw an officer at the plotting board in the next room. Lieutenant Kermit Tyler was an Air Corps pilot assigned to the aircraft warning system to learn how radar functioned. MacDonald told him about the call from Apana. Tyler was sceptical. He knew of at least two possible flights in the area. The carriers were at sea. On returning to harbour, they usually sent their planes ahead to the Navy airfields. Moreover, a flight of B-17S was due in from the mainland. But MacDonald was uneasy. He called Opana back. Lockhart answered. By now, he was excited. The screen seemed full of planes, all headed directly for Oahu. MacDonald reported that the lieutenant said it wasn't important. Lockhart insisted on talking to the officer. Tyler came to the phone. Lockhart argued he had never seen so many planes on his screen. They were now only 92 miles away, and they were coming in at almost 180 miles per hour. Tyler listened. Then, in one of the more memorable phrases of World War II, he said, Well, don't worry about it. Then he hung up. Disgusted, Lockhart decided to close down the set. But Elliot wanted to continue watching. The two men studied the screen and clocked the plane's approach. 47 miles by 7.30, 22 miles by 7.39. Suddenly the onrushing wave split in two, as if to come down both coasts of the island. Then there was nothing. The planes had disappeared behind the mountains where the radar pulses could not reach them. A pickup truck arrived at Opana to take Elliot and Lockard to breakfast. They closed down the station, climbed aboard the truck and headed back to the base camp at Kawaiola. It was 7.50. On their way down, they passed another truck, which was headed back to Opana. It was filled with men in battle helmets. Elliot and Lockard were puzzled but only until they reached the base camp nine miles away from the radar installation. The Pacific War had begun. In the confusion that followed the news of the attack on Pearl Harbor, Lockhart and Elliot never did get their breakfast. Aboard the battleship Oklahoma, moored to her bollards alongside the battleship Maryland in Battleship Row, the forenoon watch had just been piped to breakfast. The men about to be relieved of their watch were wiping the dew off the anti-aircraft guns, although only a few of the guns were manned and the ammunition for them was locked up below decks. Other sailors were taking the jack and ensign from the lockers. On the bridge, they were readying the Blue Peter signal flag, which was hoisted as a preliminary to raising the stars and stripes when the boatswain piped to the colours at 7.55.
The men about to go on watch enjoyed their last few minutes lounging about the ship. Some were finishing an after-breakfast pipe or cigarette. Across the harbour they could hear church bells for eight o'clock mass. When the first wave of planes swooped across the bay, nearly everyone thought it was just stunting navy pilots acting up again. Suddenly the quiet harbour was bedlam. Explosions erupted aboard half a dozen ships at once. Horns were blaring everywhere. Throughout the Oklahoma, everyone jumped as the loudspeakers crackled and shouted, Air raid! No drill! The first torpedoes hit the Oklahoma with a crump and a boom, and the battleship shuddered like a wounded beast. One sailor later remembered hearing a phonograph playing the popular song, Let Me Off Uptown. The impact of the first torpedo sent the phonograph into maximum volume, and for a few moments the song blared like a loudspeaker before it abruptly stopped. The next torpedo struck almost immediately after the first. The Oklahoma's lights went out. The emergency lights flickered on, went out and came on again. Then the big ship started to list. Within 20 minutes of the first attack, she began to roll over. To one sailor, she looked as if she were tired and wanted to rest. Her bottom rose from the oily water. She kept rolling until her superstructure hit the mud about 25 feet underneath. Then she stopped, looking for all the world like an enormous beached whale, except for her starboard propeller jutting out of the water. As the Oklahoma rolled to port, the men on deck scrambled to starboard and walked over onto her side, until they found themselves standing upright on her glistening hull. One man then walked along the ship's hull to the bow, waved to a passing boat and jumped in. His shoes were still dry. Some sailors plunged into the water and swam for shore. Others went hand over hand along her lines and were doused when the lines snapped. Still others stood dumbfounded on the hull of their overturned battleship and watched the mayhem all around them. The lead planes of the first wave of attacking Japanese had come in from the southeast, skimming over Mary's Point. As they crossed the harbour, at a distance of 40 to 100 feet above the water, they loosed their torpedoes, which had been specially fitted with new wooden fins in order to prevent them from going too deep. The fins did their deadly work well. The oxygen-powered torpedoes shot through the water just beneath the surface and streaked straight for their targets. Forward of the overturned Oklahoma, the California was punctured by two torpedoes. Oil spewed from her sides like blood, but her guns opened fire and kept firing throughout the raid as the California settled into the mud. Aft of the Oklahoma, the West Virginia began to sink with her decks afire, her guns also keeping up the barrage. One of the garbage lighters swung alongside to help fight her fires. Finally, the flames were put out by the harbour waters but she too sank into the mud. Her men, like an army of ants, swarmed into the oil slicks around her. The Nevada, the northeastern most of those in Battleship Row, was struck in the bow by a torpedo, but her skipper closed off the forward compartments and ordered the ship underway. As the battle wagon moved into the harbour, the dive bombers swarmed over her like hornets. The Nevada's guns opened a withering anti-aircraft fire so furious that the big ship almost disappeared in the smoke of her guns. Two Japanese planes were shot down. Fires raged across the Nevada's foredeck. One bomb blasted through a starboard gun battery. Another detonated a terrific blast below decks, spewing sheets of flame into the air. Still the ship came on, bow down and bleeding oil, smoke billowing behind, but fighting fiercely, clear of battleship row now with the stars and stripes fluttering stiffly from her fantail. It was a race for life, a stirring sight even to the attackers, but if the Nevada went down in the channel and it looked as if she might, her hulk would bottle up the entire fleet. Accordingly, signal flags went up on the Naval District water tower, stay clear of the channel. Obediently, the Nevada's quartermaster nosed the big ship toward shore. Two tugs raced to help, and she ran aground at Wapio Point, just short of the channel. The current swung her stern around and left her dead in the water. A half dozen more bombs crashed home on her foredeck and superstructure, but her crew managed to douse her fires and save the ship. The men remaining on the overturned hull of the Oklahoma were surrounded by Holocaust. Torpedo bombers and dive bombers screamed down on them, climbed and wheeled to attack them again. Zero fighters strafed them. Bombers soared over them and sent down tumbling sticks of explosives with deadly accuracy. The morning sky was polka-dotted with anti-aircraft fire and stitched with tracers from the attackers and the attacked. 
Amid the deafening din, roiling clouds of smoke swept across the harbour, and the stench of burning oil was suffocating. Then came the most thunderous explosion, as the battleship Arizona blew up. She had already taken several torpedoes when a bomb scored a hit beside her second turret. It smashed through the deck and exploded in a forward magazine. In one huge convulsion, the bomb and the Arizona's ammunition went up. The big battle wagon seemed almost to lurch out of the water. The concussion was felt for hundreds of yards around her. Fiery debris poured over the ships nearby. In an instant, the Arizona became a towering flame, 500 feet high. Three more bombs found the blazing battleship. Booming and crackling, she sank so fast she had no time to turn over. More than 1,000 men, almost four-fifths of her crew, went down in the hissing inferno. At Schofield Barracks, north of Pearl Harbor, most soldiers had just settled at the mess tables for their Sunday pancakes and extra half-pint of milk when they heard explosions in the distance. They doing some blasting? One asked through a mouthful. A plane roared low over the mess hall, its guns firing. Carrying their precious half-pints of milk, the soldiers ran out to see what was going on. Private James Jones was standing against the wall when he saw another plane, with red suns on its wings, which came up the boulevard, preceded by two lines of holes that kept popping up 80 yards in front on the asphalt. The plane came so close that Jones could clearly see the pilot. A white silk scarf streamed from the pilot's neck, and a hachimaki, a white headband, was wound about his helmet with a red spot at the forehead. As the plane swooped past, the pilot grinned and waved. At Schofield Barracks and at many other installations, soldiers and airmen ran for machine guns, mounted them on railings, benches, any support that was available, and fired on the attackers. The men breakfasting at Hickam Field did not even have time to run out to watch. One of the first dive bombers hit the mess hall. In the shower of crockery, knives, forks and food, 35 men died and many others were wounded, won by a flying gallon jar of mayonnaise. Nearby, a Navy chaplain had a few moments of warning because he was getting ready for an outdoor mass. Setting up his altar in the open, he saw the planes as they came for the field. He rushed to a nearby machine gun, lugged it over, mounted it on his altar, and sent up an arcing barrage as the planes swooped over him. But at Hickam and at Wheeler Field, twelve miles away, by the time any defence was organised, it was too late. Since the November war warning from Washington, precautions had been taken against sabotage, not against air attack. On both fields, the bombers and fighter planes were lined up wingtip to wingtip, so they could more easily be surrounded by guards. The tidy lines of planes were not only sitting ducks, but ducks in rows, and they were systematically destroyed by the Japanese, who had targeted them for the first waves of the attack. At the height of the first onslaught, the expected B-17S came in after a long flight from the US mainland. They arrived only five minutes after the first bombs fell, and they flew in just east of the track taken by the Japanese. There were twelve of them. They had flown for fourteen hours, and their fuel tanks were nearly dry. To make the distance, the B-17S had been stripped of armour and ammunition, and their guns were packed in Cosmoline. The pilots had no warning, and when the first Japanese planes went for them, they thought they were being escorted to their landing field. They were shortly disabused of the notion by flying bullets and by the laconic voice from Hickam's control tower, which provided landing instructions and calmly announced that the field was under attack. One B-17 was destroyed as it rolled to a halt, its crew jumping out to dash for the nearest cover. Others veered away with fuel gauges on empty and pancaked onto small airstrips. One landed on a golf course. Most of the B-17S were damaged, but all but one got through the hail of fire, including some from the Americans below. While the torpedo bombers and dive bombers were making their runs, Fuchida watched the water spouts mushrooming up around the ships from a vantage point east of Oahu at 10,000 feet. Then he banked his bomber sharply, the signal for his ten high-level squadrons to form in single columns for their runs. At that point, Fuchida turned the command over to the squadron's specially trained pilot and bombardier, the best in the Japanese Navy, Fuchida later recalled. The new commander's plane surged into the van. As it passed, Fuchida noted the bombardier's round, smiling face and saw him snap off a smart salute. From Fuchida's orbiting platform, 
The scene below was an inferno of exploding ships and planes, blazing oil slicks and billowing black smoke. Battleship Row already lay devastated. Only the Maryland and the Pennsylvania, trapped in board of the two sinking ships, were comparatively unhurt, and Fuchida's bombers were zeroing in on them. The American defenders were firing back now. Fuchida was astonished at the speed of their response. Were it the Japanese fleet, the reaction would not have been so quick, he recalled. Dark grey bursts blossomed here and there until the sky was clouded with shattering near misses that made our plane tremble. In the barrage, a Zero exploded in mid-air. A torpedo plane pinwheeled into the water. Another in flames flew flat out into a United States ship and exploded. Fuchida's wingman was hit. His bomb load fell away prematurely, and the bomb cinch lines fluttered out like entrails from a gaping wound. The pilot held up a blackboard bearing the message, fuel tank destroyed, then asked for and got permission to finish the bomb run. I knew it was futile, Fuchida said later, but I understood the feelings of the pilot and crew. Then Fuchida's own plane bounced as if struck by a huge club. The fuselage is hold to port, his radio operator shouted. A steering control wire is wrecked, but the plane kept flying. Ignoring the shells bursting around him, Fuchida pulled the safety bolt from his bomb release lever and watched the plane ahead. When its bomb dropped, that was Fuchida's signal to drop his bomb. He remembered later that it seemed as if time was standing still. Broken clouds scudded by, obscuring the target. The bombardier signalled another run. The planes banked into their turn. I studied the anti-aircraft fire, knowing that we would have to run through it again, Fuchida later wrote. It seemed that this might well be a date with eternity. Just then, a colossal explosion erupted on Battleship Row. It was the Arizona. The shockwave from the blast tossed Fuchida's plane, more than half a mile distant, like a cork on the water. Fuchida's awestruck pilot shouted, Terrible! Now it was the turn of Fuchida's squadron to run the anti-aircraft fire. Their principal target was the Maryland, just in front of the furiously smouldering Tennessee. The lead plane flashed the ready signal, and Fuchida gripped the bomb release again. This time he squeezed it. As the bombs fell, Fuchida watched through a peephole in the floor of his plane. Four bombs in perfect pattern plummeted like devils of doom, he recounted. They grew smaller and smaller. I forgot everything in the thrill of watching them. They became small as poppy seeds and finally disappeared as tiny white flashes of smoke appeared on and near the ship. He cried aloud, Two hits! Resuming command, Fuchida ordered his planes back to their carriers as soon as their runs were done, but the commander himself still had work to do. At precisely 8.54, a full 59 minutes after the first bombs exploded, a second wave of raiders swept in around Diamond Head. 54 were bombers, targeting on Hickam and the naval air station at Kaneoha. 81 dive bombers continued the assault on the fleet. 36 Zeros backed them up with cannon and machine gun fire. The dive bombers abandoned their assigned targets. The smoke was too thick to find them and turned to the ships still hurling up a curtain of fire. Then, as suddenly as they had come, the attackers vanished. Fuchida made a final pass to photograph the stricken harbour and to attempt, through the thick pall of smoke, to assess the damage before racing back to his carrier, which even then was beginning its run back to Japan's home waters. Fuchida knew the raid had been successful, but he did not entirely grasp the full extent of the destruction that his raiders had left behind. Aina, little more than an hour and 45 minutes, the Japanese had destroyed 188 planes and damaged 159 others, and had sunk or seriously damaged 18 ships of war, including the Arizona and the Oklahoma. The California, West Virginia and Tennessee would not rejoin the fleet for months. The Pennsylvania and the Maryland would be out of action for weeks. In all, the United States had lost 2,403 killed and 1,178 wounded. On their part, the Japanese had lost 29 planes and pilots, all five midget submarines and one big sub, with their crews. Back on his ship, when he had time to digest the reports, the contented vice-admiral in charge of the strike's carrier fleet, Chuichi Nagumo, made his report to his staff. We may conclude, he said, that the results we anticipated have been achieved. When the last Japanese planes broke off their shattering assault on Pearl Harbor, 
They headed northwest to overtake carriers that were already speeding back to Japan. In the pattern of destruction left behind, survivors of the attack tended their wounded, battled the fires and counted their dead. Surrounded by wreckage and human suffering, they felt stranded and defenseless, like you had four flat tires out in the desert, as one soldier put it. Looming in their minds also was the threat of invasion, the pervasive fear the Japanese would follow their raid by landing on the islands. They could have come in canoes and we couldn't have stopped them, said another soldier. Invasion rumours and false reports were everywhere. Japanese paratroops were said to have landed on the big island of Hawaii. Word spread that Honolulu's water supply had been poisoned. The capture of the midget submarine at left escalated the invasion fears. Perhaps it was on a reconnaissance mission to pave the way for landings. The Hawaiians widely believed that a well-organised fifth column of spies and saboteurs existed among the island's large Japanese colony. Martial law was declared within hours of the raid. The FBI quickly rounded up suspected enemy agents, including 370 Japanese nationals, 98 Germans and 14 Italians. Against the possibility of further attacks, a total blackout was imposed on all of the Hawaiian islands, and many servicemen's families were evacuated to the mainland. Gun emplacements and barbed wire bristled along mined beaches. More importantly, as it turned out for the future course of the war, feverish and largely successful efforts were immediately instituted to salvage as much as possible of the battered fleet. Of the 19 ships damaged by the bombing, all but three would see action later against the Japanese. Gradually, as rebuilding efforts accelerated, the reflexive fear and witch-hunting of the post-raid weeks receded, and Pearl Harbor and other Hawaiian bases were transformed into crucial staging areas for the eventual counterattack in the Pacific.